everyone uh just want to give a couple of minutes for people to uh to log in we'll be starting in uh about two minutes how are you feeling aaron we're, we're i believe we're live i feel great yeah. no I'm, I'm 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 filling the air Right on, that's good. I'm very yeah. excited. I'm sure you're excited. I hope everybody out there is excited. Anxious to get started? All right, we're gonna give it one more minute and then we're gonna get going. Great. All right. All righty, why don't we begin? Um, Let's. Welcome everyone. Uh, I am super excited, um, as I hope you all are. I just want to let you know before we go anywhere, uh, we've had an incredible uh, turnout. Uh, almost 400 design-minded people have decided to attend this webinar. We are truly grateful for that. We're super excited to present to you um, from Iguzini Systemalux Hosting, our Biophilia Design Trend Series. Our first installment is called Illuminating the Mystery. We're excited about the topic. We're excited to continue discussing this topic over the next uh, several months. And we're super excited about our presenter, Alam Sklar. Um, Alam uh, is uh, a super successful uh, creative director. She has over 18 years of experience managing design-minded people and creatives in a variety of different companies, uh, all with very forward-thinking design intents. Today, she runs her own company. It's a uh, design uh, forecasting, trend forecasting company called Messy Data. And we at Iguzini Systemalux are super proud to introduce to you and to bring to you the vision of Alan Sklar. All right. Thank you, Aaron. It's a You're very welcome. nice introduction. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, I guess I just just to talk a little bit about myself and what creative direction is. Um, I have my background as a as a fine artist, uh, and I went like many artists do into business and into the design industry as a way of making a living. And I worked with men, for many years in lighting, uh, candles, paintings rugs, cushions, all kinds of product. And <clears throat> I worked mostly initially as a product development person, as an artist uh, designing and creating product. And one of the things that um, I always got interested in, or what I, this uh, kind of an inner struggle I had because of my background as a fine artist, was how do you do original work or inspired work or work that has a soul, so to speak, work that can sing, and still do something that's commercially relevant, um, that's on trend and that people want? And how do you mitigate that tension? And as I asked that question and sort of moved, you know, progressed in my career to creative direction, I realized one of the hardest things you can do when you're working with creatives is to inspire them to do uh, original work that's also somehow on trend and relevant and interesting and fulfilling the needs of the community at that moment. So it prepared me in a lot of ways for the work that I do right now, which is to look very deeply at cultural trends and try to understand why um, we like what we like, why what is trending is trending, and why uh, and also how to engage with it in an original way by understanding the root of the trend, not by just looking simply at palettes or simple design directives, but looking at the heart of the trend and why it's happening. Because I think as creatives, as entrepreneurs, as business people, if we understand why something's happening and why people are so drawn to something, it empowers us much more to have creative solutions uh, for our clients and for any kind of design space that we're working with. So that's a bit of an introduction to me. Um, today, I wanna talk about biophilia, it's a huge trend that's, I mean, it's been obviously like most trends, it starts off in a very kind of small um, area 
in this in this case in kind of the intellectual milieu as an idea in the 1960s and 70s and has slowly progressed to become more and more relevant until now it's probably i would say the most important design trend um, especially for commercial public spaces uh, that's on that's in the that's in the field right now and i like to start my trend talks by connecting myself to the trend and that's because i really i'm one of those people that doesn't think these trends are superficial i think trends are very deep i think they respond to very deep cultural needs and i think that's why they're popular that's why they get uh, so much attention and that the best way as a creative to uh, really understand a trend is to find your own way in so I'm going to start with talking about myself and something um, I've lived with all my life. So my whole, I, I, can, I can be very, I think I'm going to be vulnerable with you right now and let you know that as a young girl, I was introverted and, and a, to a tortured soul, kind of, you know, I was extremely, extremely stressed out, um, caught in my own thought cycle, Kind of imprisoned by my own thoughts if you want to say and pretty depressed even at quite a young age and i tell you this because one of the things that that's interesting about childhood and i think we can all relate to this is that we don't remember that much we have like key memories that come back um, from our childhood that sort of reinforce i guess who we think we are but we also have ones that are anomalous that we can never really understand why they figure so prominently in our mind and yet they're memories we go back to again and again and for me one of those memories is a trip that i took to bryce canyon national park in utah in the united states um i was a kid and as i said i was you know pretty melancholic uh, intense depressed little kid and I remember not being all that excited about going to the park. I remember resisting and just feeling like, you know, reading and staying inside. And this was before iPhones, because my God, would I have been in trouble if I as a child had grown up with that kind of, uh, that kind of gizmo around. But reading all the time and sort of losing myself in fiction. And I really didn't want to go and take a hike in the Bryce National Park. But, um, you know, it was a family trip and they forced me out and it really it really my memory of the place is just of being kind of gobsmacked by not only how stunning it was but how weird it was how huge it was how it kind of almost looked like a martian landscape um the stone was bright orange everything about it was odd and strange and huge. And we, when we started to explore it, obviously there was incredible amount of heat. So it was very, very hot. And um, what, what I remember most about it is, is, is I just, honestly, I just had visual memories of this most astonishing experience and of, of the way things looked. And it's like, it's sort of like a beacon in my mind I have since discussed with my sister kind of sort of some of what happened back then because she has a more narrative memory and I'm much more visual as an artist. Um, but she tells me that we actually, you know, got lost and ran out of water and had quite an ordeal when we were there, which I'm sure adds to the intensity of my emotion. But in in truth my sense of that place is really my my ongoing memory that kind of that flash that image i have is one of awe-inspiring beauty um and it's a memory that for whatever reason has stayed with me and come back to me over the years and i've never questioned why and i've never really thought about it so one of the things i just wanted to sort of begin with that because that's a kind of a very deep um, personal connection I have to an experience in nature that for whatever reason has haunted me over the years. And 
I come back now to us and to what's happening in our culture right now. And unfortunately, um, we all know that we're in a period of crisis. And it really, it doesn't matter um, what political affiliation you have or how you see what's happening or how you interpret, but there's, there's no doubt that there's a tremendous amount of change and uncertainty and, um, you know, there's definitely environmental or weather conditions happening, there's extinctions, there's political extremism, there's some kind of polarization happening. And in a way, I related back to um, my condition in childhood in the sense that we're in a period of tremendous anxiety and turbulence and uncertainty. And I think that it's important to understand where we are right now, because it's it really determines the trends or the belief systems that are most attractive to us right now. One of the things that's happening, you know, in the culture at large is that when you're in a period of flux or uncertainty and a lot of things are falling apart, um, often the most creative people are the people at the forefront that are really thinking about how to create those solutions for those problems. Uh, you know, whether it's kind of the creativity in the form of activism or it's artists or it's architects or it's scientists, people are trying to figure out how to respond to um, the, the, both the political and the environmental changes that are happening around us. And what I think is so interesting about times like this of great difficulty and of uncertainty is that it presents an incredible opportunity for creative people because people are hungry for solutions and they're much more open to new ways of seeing things. And so despite the fact that we're in a tremendous period of flux, for people that are within the creative industry, um, this is actually a, a chance to get back down to what you truly believe in, figure out what you think really works and be able to apply it in a sincere way, which I think is very exciting for artists. One of the things that um, is uh, often, often talked about in situations or in times of peril is that the belief systems that you have in place that explain the world and that help run the world and justify a lot of your decisions no longer make sense because the world around you is falling apart. And it's like, you're like, well, if, if you're telling me that this solution is gonna lead to peace of mind and I don't have any peace of mind, then what value is that solution? And so part of the disruption of this kind of a period is a great questioning of values, of what we consider true, of what we consider um, just, of what we consider evil. And that reckoning is called, a, is like, is basically a brink, something called like the brink of a paradigm change. And one of the things that's so fascinating about these periods in history, when we go through these vast changes and we have these paradigm changes where we're questioning what it is that we value and what we think makes meaning in the world, is that we often return to nature and we try to say, well, what is, what is how does nature work? Nature is an absolute reality. We're all here together. We're in this environment. There's no getting away from the, the kind of reality of, um, of our physicality and of our place on the earth and of our physical needs and of our emotional needs. There's no getting away from that. So when we're really shaken and have to reconsider what we truly believe, many, many people go back to nature and they try to understand what's timeless and true right what's been true for ages and ages what isn't based on the last guy you elected or the last person that you were in a relationship with right it's based on these kind of timeless truths and when we get our when we have kind of an assessment of nature that, that like we have an orientation we think we understand what nature is trying to teach us that is how we as a community often take those rules and begin to rebuild society and one of the reasons i mean and one of the things i'd like to talk about is is sort of the world we live in right now and and how we saw nature and how we constructed our world based on how we saw nature to begin with. And 
one of my favorite kind of examples of that is this the great designer and I, I chose him because I know I'm speaking to people that build um, that work in the industry and that build work on big projects and commercial spaces and design is Le Corbusier and the thing that is so um, interesting about him is that he not only was an artist and had a very clear sense of what appealed to him he had a very strong sense of mission he had a very strong sense of vision when it came to his work and his thought was that man ultimately had to take charge of his own destiny had to be very clear about what he wanted and why and could then take what he would call a straight path from point A to point B um, in order to accomplish his goals. And because he's an architect, he takes a lot of his ideas and he relates them to architectural terms like geometry. So for him, one of the beautiful things about geometry and straight lines was that they could reinforce our power, our dominion over nature. One of the best, um, one of the uh, his most interesting stories about Le Corbusier is this, um, at least is very talked about in the design community, is this idea that man, like that there's kind of two ways of being in the world. One is, a, is being a man and, and deciding what you want and going from point A to point B and achieving that goal, no matter how um, difficult it seems, by sheer force of will, um, like putting a type rope between two skyscrapers, right? And the other was was the passage of a donkey. And his feeling was, you know, a donkey knows no better. He takes the path of least, path of least resistance. He gets distracted by what's going on around him. He gets drawn by the sound of water, the smell of food. He meanders. He takes his time. And this is sort of circuitous route called it a zigzag route. And he felt it was at the heart of a lot of um, medieval landscape design, sorry, urban planning, because the roads were so kind of irrational and zigzagging. So he was like, it, it's based on the meandering of a zigzagging donkey kind of thing. And his, his premise was, if we are going to dominate nature and um, have dominion over our natural environment and create a better life for ourselves, we need to work primarily with straight lines and right angles and we need to we need to impose our will on the world around us and one of the ways that we can already see those things being challenged is and i one of my favorite things to do is to always look at artists because artists generally are expressing our thoughts and our dreams before we as a culture become conscious of them. And that's primarily because they, they live kind of intuitively and they live as outliers. And even if, and this is, I mean, this is my personal philosophy, but it, it's based on many, many years of working in the commercial industry, they might feel that they're um, expressing something unique within themselves. My, my general belief is that they are anticipating stories or there is it's something I would call collective imagination. They are anticipating stories that we will all later buy into. And so when I'm looking for ideas and watching them emerge in the landscape, I will often look at artists. And um, I'm forgive me if I mispronounce his name, Oliver Ellison, um, is an incredibly um, innovative installation artist. And one of his approaches to installation was to go into these extremely linear box-like buildings, art galleries, right? And there's nothing more in a sense, there's no better homage to abstraction than an art gallery with straight lines and white walls. And he would go in and he would invade these spaces with these sort of irrational nat natural landscapes, right? That had to be, um, traveled or discovered by the participant and and really one of the things one of the trademarks about his work that's so interesting is it does not have a specific path or a straight line it is it's not a mess i mean it's natural 
but it's definitely um, chaotic, uh, unpredictable, disorganized, and in a sense, it's the ultimate, it's the ultimate confrontation of the donkey pass in the middle of a very structured environment. And he started working on these pieces 20 or 25 years ago. So really anticipating that there was something about this approach to the world that was problematic and that needed to be challenged. And so um, here's an image of people sort of exploring the space, each going through any way that they want above, beyond, over, jumping. But really, um, in a sense, and this goes right back to the idea of the donkey, not having a purpose, right? And generally, when you think about um, going to a museum, let's say you're going to the Louvre, you might have in mind the purpose of seeing the Mona Lisa. And you might know exactly where it is, and you might make a beeline. You might make a very straight line to go see the Mona Lisa. The thing about, about this um, kind of artwork is that there is no purpose and there is no place to go. It's simply a place of exploration. So when we look at that, that kind of confrontation of Corbusier by um, this installation art, one of the things that I find fascinating is that there's a confrontation between the role of the person or the role of the individual vis-a-vis -vis the environment. In one, in one context, the man has, or the, or the human being, the man, woman, ha, is sentient and has a soul and has agency and has control or dominion over their environment. In the other potential challenge, the man is part of a landscape that hasn't necessarily been made or fashioned for him, that isn't necessarily at his disposal, and he's a part of it and there might not be an end game. So one of the things that I'm, one of the, I mean, we all have benefited incredibly from the last big um, paradigm shift in the 15 and 1600s called the Enlightenment, when we actually took a step back from um, more superstitious sort of intuitive orientation to the world and said, you know what, if we really begin to, as a collective, systematically analyze the world around us and record what we see, there's a possibility that we could, over time, begin to master our environment and improve our situation as a species. And so um, there was a tremendous movement of exploration and of curiosity and of openness um, it was a very, very exciting time. And there was, and in a sense, the world was a very mysterious place and we were slowly decoding the world. And I think one of the things that was the most revelatory about um, the Enlightenment is the idea that there were patterns, that there were patterns greater than we had expected through disciplines we had not seen, unseen relationships and categories and it was really a period of tremendous expansion and insight. And I think obviously not called the enlightenment um, by mistake, but a period when really as human beings in a, in, we really took, um, we took our destiny in our own hands and we really began to build and the amount of progress that was done in the last 500 years compared to the last 6,000 is really quite astonishing. And in, in a lot of ways, what we what we what happened in our culture is that we we in a sense over time began to impose our will and our desires on the environment around us. I think one of my interpretation of what's happening right now, um, and 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 it's based on a lot of um, a lot of. I guess, influenced by thinkers in the field of animism, which we're going to look at coming up, is that even though um, the Enlightenment period created the world uh, a, a tremendously uh, high quality of life for most of us, um, and really I'm myself personally very grateful for, uh, for all of the kind of ease and um, 
technology that surrounds me that makes my life uh, makes me makes me allowed to uh, have leisure time and take time to think for myself and not be constantly um, obsessed with my own survival um, or or you know having a superstitious belief system so that things work out for myself. As much as that's great, one of one of the things that's happened is that our culture is no longer sustainable. And for me, it's really important to, to point out that that's not a moral judgment on humanity. It's just that the, the structure and the system that we set up in place, the amount of things we can, the, the fuel we consume, the food we consume, the energy we consume, um, the objects we buy is not sustainable. And that's a word we hear a lot in the world right now. And all it means is we can't keep living like this forever. And all the benefits and the joys that we ourselves take part of are not, we're not gonna be able to pass them on to our children because we're just, we're, we're, we're at the edge of, we are exhausting the resources of this planet. And that is really the crisis that we're that we're facing today. And the the point here is that the Enlightenment and its its kind of agenda of of mastering the world around it, of sort of 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 sort of imposing the the human will on the environment around us, is no longer working for us. One of the things that's happening, one of the philosophies that's emerging in our culture, and it's 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 something that I think is going to only get uh, more and more strong, and I think is actually the basis for the biophilic design movement, is something called new animism. And so animism, I think primitive primitive animism, um, often seen in a very derogatory way, uh, was the idea in in cultures before uh, monotheism that the world was alive, that everything was alive and that everything on the planet had a spirit or could be animated, animism. One of the things that the new animism says is it's not a return to that as much as it's a recognition through the discoveries of the enlightenment period itself, that the degree in which we are integrated with and a part of our environment, indeed that we are made of stardust is reigniting that sense that we might be part of an organism that is greater than us as opposed to having dominion over something we might be part of something and because we are a part of that not have as much control as we think we do so there's something um about animism and that deep sense of the world being um, animated or alive as a thought, as a philosophy. And remember, one of the things that I think happens when you're in a period of crisis is there's many, many competing philosophies or descriptions of the world. Um, people offer all kinds of solutions for how to create certainty and to be safe again. But what it is about animism or the new animism that I think is so powerful and so appealing whether people are aware of it or not, is this sense that we are part of something bigger than us and we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to have all the answers. We need to engage in a creative way with the environment around us. Um, we need to be open, we need to be fearless, we need to be curious, but we are part of something that by its very nature is more complex and um, more mysterious than we are, and therefore it isn't about us trying to find the solution. It's about us trying to, or or create or impose a solution. It's about us discovering a solution. This is really at the heart of the paradigm shift that I want to look at today, and how that's affecting design. Again, when we go back to innovative art and artists that are um, sort of hinting or um, foreshadowing greater shifts in consciousness. I also like to look at um, this, this woman, Maja Petrick. Again, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing her name correctly. Um, and, and one of her pieces called We Are All Light. This is a fantastic installation. It's, it uses uh, a lot of modern technology. 
uses AI, uses projection. Fundamentally, one of the things that that happens in this experience of this of this um, um, call it an installation is that when you go and you move into that space, your movements, your body, your information is recorded and projected into that space, and it stays. So each time new people come in, they're moving through that same space and they're adding to the movement of your body as it's been recorded and projected in that space. And the idea that is over time cumulatively, people are collectively creating this artwork just by existing, just by moving through it, just by partaking. They don't even have to understand. They're part of something bigger than themselves. And the, the end game or the final artwork is based completely on the random movements of the people involved. So each time this, this installation is set up, the artwork is different. And so you can see how as an artist, she's intuitively trying to engage with this idea of us as creative agents, but creative agents within something bigger than us where our very existence has an impact or a contribution on what's happening. And that there's a whole kind of nesh or embeddedness, embeddedness going on. The thing, I mean, one of the things about new animism that I think we're seeing a lot of evidence in, in the culture at large is this very, this, this sense that um, nature itself is alive and that as opposed to, um, as opposed to something that we can we can like uh, take advantage of or grow or exploit, um, that it has a kind of sense potentially, it has a, a sense of consciousness or an experience that we can become interested in and in relationship to. And one of the ways that we see that is in the most banal way, this kind of huge sense that nature is itself a healing tool and that people if they want to feel better need to go out into nature and take a walk in a park or by a river or sit in a garden and and the question really is like why would going out into that environment necessarily make you feel better unless that environment had something to offer you right so you're not an ensouled um, a kind of singularly ensouled, powerful being, the only being in the environment that has agency or consciousness, going into an inert environment and then being kind of getting, feeling better. You're going into an environment and you are getting something from that experience, from that interaction in that natural setting that makes you feel better. And we can all agree and more and more in um, medicine and in therapy, people are, can agree that natural environments have a, cre a deeply healing effect. And what we don't realize is that that's a deeply animistic belief that just by being in relationship with another place that's alive, we ourselves can feel better. And, and that's one of the really important I think basic understandings that has led to this movement of biophilia, which is really love of life. Philia is love and bio is nature, I'm assuming. And it's this love of life, this sort of deep engagement with the environment around us that is the source of, of health and well being. And we can see that more and more in our culture, in, in holistic medicines, in holistic foods, in um, having roof gardens, having, you know, having gar eating food directly from, from farm to table, um, and the introduction of plant life into healing environments. So we're seeing a lot of evidence of this new orientation towards the natural world without necessarily knowing why it's happening. And and one of the things that I think is super important about the biophilic movement, um, and I think that it's often characterized as plant life or having plants in a house or having a, a wall of plants or having potted plants. And designers, as designers, we think, ah, to work in it, to create a biophilic environment, 
we're ne going to need to recreate a nature inside of a space. And this is where biophilic design is different from a lot of the, the movements that have sort of um, admired nature and tried to bring nature into the home. This is where biophilia distinguishes itself. Because what biophilia says is it, it bases itself on that deep animistic belief that the world is alive and that the more connected we are and intermeshed with the world around us, the healthier, the more productive, the clearer thinking we're going to be as human beings. And so anything that comes from that natural environment, anything that comes from the world is biophilic design, not just plants. And again, going back to Maja Petrick, um, one of her projects in New York City was to do this tunnel that's actually um, in New York City between two subway stations called the Tunnel of, tunnel of Doom. And a very, very depressing space and it's a space that's obviously very prone to um, crime. And her biophilic project was the idea that natural light and the play of light and our relationship to light was enough to humanize or, you know, or make a space more alive, make a space more um, less depressing. And what she did was she created these sort of faux cracks in the ceiling that she placed light in. And these lights were programmed to mimic whatever was happening above ground. So the implication here, or what people would think quite naturally was that these were cracks that were actually letting light from the outside in. So if it were a cloudy day, there would be sort of low light, diffuse light. If it were a very bright day, there would be very bright, sharp light. And in the evening, it would be very low light as if it were coming from yellow street lamps. And what they found was that just by creating this space, just by allowing this to reanimate this space with natural light was enough to reduce um, the crime that was happening in there and to elevate people's sense of despair in walking in this long tunnel. And that to me is a really great example of what biophilia is. Again, it the other the thing about biophilia that I think is really important it to understand is it's as diverse and rich as the planet itself. And um, there's been a huge movement in design to uh, respect and reflect um, local beliefs, local folklore, local design traditions in any kind of you know, project that you're working on, it's just as good or just as important to reflect the natural environment. So I think, again, if you live in a world or if you live in an environment that isn't very green, then bringing plants into your house is not biophilic. What is biophilic is recognizing the shapes the forms, the way light plays in your environment and reproducing that kind of local flavor at the level of the design level. And um, again, recognizing that it's possible to create, um, going back to Le Corbusier and, and the idea, Le Corbusier and the idea of, of a linear of a linear structure because everybody knows what they want to do and knows what they need to achieve in a period of crisis i what people actually want is a space where they can contemplate and wonder and be outside of themselves and reevaluate things in a new way and those those kinds of thought processes happen much more organically in these natural spaces because the world is alive and ever-changing, because we are part of something bigger than ourselves, because we actually don't know what we want to do and where we want to go. And, and the solution or the orientation towards a solution comes more easily in environments that embrace that than in those sterile um, white boxes. One of the elements of, of biophilia also that is fascinating, um, one of the things we never think of reproducing in design, but is so true in the natural world, is that element of danger or risk. And the question is, why would we want to bring any sense of precariousness or danger or risk into our natural, into our, into our built environment? Um, 
everything about shelter in the past has been about uh, obfuscating any kind of risk, you know, creating walls, creating walls around cities, creating sterile environments and being as safe as possible. But it turns out that we are actually, we have evolved to um, have, a, have a desire or have a propensity to always be analyzing risk in our environment to try to determine what the best path forward is going to be. And so if we're not engaging that part of our mind that's scanning, that's interested, that's curious, that's making sure everything's safe, when we're not engaging that part of our mind, we're actually much less engaged in our own lives and in our own communities. So that idea that you can sort of turn off a part of your own kind of heritage, your own your own heritage as a as a as a as a being in an in a in an, an alive environment that might potentially also have threat, the is there there's this notion of this incredible loss that also happens. And so in biophilia, one of the things that's incredibly important in in the design structure is again to have elements of risk, have elements of danger that are obviously very small, very controlled, but that still elicit a sense of, I have to pay attention as I walk up the staircase because there's no railing on it. Or I have to pay attention as I move through this because I actually don't know what's around that bend. So I can't go running full steam ahead because I might crash into something. So all of those considerations are actually connected to a deeper process of exploration and engagement with your environment that um, again in a period of crisis is extremely important for us to be able to tap into. One of the things um, that's amazing about biophilic design um, is that again that recognition that we are not designing anymore to conquer nature but we are actually designing in a way to allow access to nature, allow ourselves to have a relationship or an experience of nature that we might not otherwise have. And it goes back again to that idea of a safe risk. It's to allow ourselves to be in the environment and still be protected, not be separated from the environment, still be part of the natural world, integrated into the natural world and stimulated, excited, curious, alive, connected to the natural world, but still somehow have just enough safety to be able to thrive. Again, that's a really important balance for biophilic design. And one of the projects I want to look at is this project in Iceland. Um, it's a spa and a hotel called the Blue Lagoon Resort. And it is really, it's on the edge of a volcano. And Again, what could be more mysterious, more powerful, and more terrifying than a volcano? And yet, volcanic land is extremely rich. It's extremely fertile. Um, you know, there's a lot. There's hot, hot, um, hot pools. There's places. What are they called? I'm, I'm having a, a moment. Natural springs that are heated. There's all these amazing. It, it, it's really quite in a. It's a quite rich environment and it has a lot to offer for us as humans but again it's innately intimidating it's it in it, it feels it feels unlivable and so the idea of building um, a spa on the edge of a volcano kind of cut into volcanic rock is 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 a biophilic idea but the reason i think that it is so appealing right now is that people want to have those experiences of being able to go and explore and live within the mystery of something within a safe context and one of the some of the principles that come up with bio, biophilic design and it's no surprise is that you try as much as possible to mimic the environment you're in so you try to use the materials and you try to leave um, all the surfaces as intact as possible so that there's a tactile situation. And you try to uh, camouflage in a lot of ways, camouflage the architecture into the environment that it's in. But what's so important 
what's really important more than actually the way it looks in going back to the idea of animism and the fact that what is new about this this new orientation towards the world is that it's an alive relationship or conversation between yourself and the world around you in which you don't necessarily have a clear purpose and you don't know what's going to happen is your experience as you move through the space and that can be controlled with all kinds of um, mechanisms, obscured views, curves, interesting lighting. But even more than that, and, and this is where um, I think I'm gonna say something that most people don't associate with biophilic lighting, uh, bio, sorry, with biophilic design, is this idea that the environment itself is dynamic and changing and unpredictable. And one of the reasons that at, we're at a point in culture where we're even more capable of, of of um, reproducing that now than ever is because of technology. It's because of technology's ability to animate a space and to use technology to be able to bring in those elements of unpredictability and change. Um, for those of us who can't build a structure in Iceland, in uh, you know a volcanic crater, um, and basically use all the beauty around us and exploit it and be able to sort of um, benefit from that. The idea here is that we're looking at, at, a, at a place, we're looking at a place like that is about living next to and sort of exploring both the power and the mystery of a volcano and the sort of heat and the darkness and the, <clears throat> and the dappled light and all of these things. We're looking at that project, but what we take from it as designers are those elements that we ourselves can incorporate even within urban environment and even using modern technology to recreate that sense that we are within um, a mysterious living uh, organism. <clears throat> One of the other aspects, obviously, about this, this environment, it's a spa. And so, again, we can see I think most of us as designers are recognizing more and more um, the use of rock and the use of stone and having that natural formations um, emerge more and more in design magazines and buildings that don't um, attempt to carve out a square space, but that actually accommodate the environment around it and bring in the natural walls as part of the design. Uh, again, very much a biophilic movement. And again, going back to um, the donkey, the idea that you're accommodating what's happening around you, that you are not um, cutting through the mountain in order to make the highway, you are, you are meandering around the mountain, you are finding other, path other pathways to go around the mountain because you understand that that journey, that longer journey around the mountain is actually more crucial to your health and well-being than that straight line right through the mountain. Another part of the project that's fascinating is the again the idea of lighting mimicking the natural environment and one of the things that they did in their guest rooms um, was to try to mimic the idea of a celestial, a celestial form, um, a circle that gives light and that has um, specifically in this case that you know has the same effect when you look at it through clouds the sort of diffuseness with a ring around it but also that it is changing and then it can mimic or be in sync with the outside world this is way beyond um, circadian lighting which is of course incredibly important which is the idea of um, pacing your own uh, pacing the the, qual the the temperature of the light from colds to warms over the course of the day as it would be in our natural environment within our built environment, something that we've recognized over time is very important, especially to our health. This is about actually mimicking the changeability within a course of a day, right? In biophilia, it's not simply that you're following the course of the sun. It's that within any given day, there'll be clouds, there'll be um, storms, there'll be some kind of unpredictable weather that you need to adapt to, um, that you need to respond to, 
And what does it mean in design not to simply have something on a time of mechanism, sort of like the clockwork universe we're talking about from the sort of enlightenment paradigm. What is it like to have lighting that can mimic um, what's happening to the world outside? Another project, um, and this one is called the Under Restaurant, I believe in, in uh, Norway. Again, it's based, it's in a rugged, rugged landscape, and you can't tell from looking at this image, but it goes directly under the water. So it's basically a restaurant that penetrates, penetrates the surface of the water and then goes deep down to the ocean floor. And one of the things about this kind of design and one of the reasons that it's so powerful is that it goes to a place that we have an infinite curiosity about, kind of infinite sense of mystery about the ocean and really have absolutely, most of us have absolutely no access to exploring that environment. And what's so interesting about this construction in particular is that it doesn't go into um, kind of beautific Mediterranean warm ocean. This is a northern freezing cold, dark and mysterious ocean. And the restaurant basically is, is built so that it goes, plummets right into the earth. And again, one of the, one of the things that it exemplifies of, in terms of biophilic design and that sort, of, that sort of sense of mystery, of the mystery of our interaction with the world or with, the, with nature in particular, is that when you first come in, you can't see all the way down. So the view is obscured. The second thing is that the quality of the light, it is not lit like a normal space would be. It is, it, it is lit as though you were underwater with sort of mediated light that's gone through, light waves that have gone through the ocean. So the color is adjusted and it's very muted and you move down into this dark, mysterious cave, and you are not only going under the water, but the built environment is mimicking the experience of what it would be like to be going down under the water um, in a diving suit or something like that. And the, sorry, the bad stuff that just happened. Okay, <laughs> so, I just had a moment of surprise when I realized that I'm already at the end, which goes to show how much I'm enjoying this talk. I hope you can uh, um, forgive the mistake. But what is so deep and important about this kind of design is that this um, restaurant also serves a function of informing and educating, and it serves the food from the local area. And so, not only does it give people a sort of direct engagement with that environment, it also immediately elicits without any explanation why that environment's important and why we need to take care of it. So that I'm just to talk again about that power of biophilic design um, and the effect that it has sort of in a nonlinear way in communicating sort of the importance of taking care of this earth and sort of redefining our relationship to this earth just gives you a sense of how important um, and how vital the role of design can be. And I did want to return at the end to my memory of um, Bryce Canyon and my obsession or sort of that reoccurring image as a child that I finally understood when I was looking at all of this design uh, trend that was going on around us. And I thought, you know, if I think about what happened to me when I went to Bryce Canyon, and I think about what changed while I was there and what changed afterward, was that I was taken out of my own confined, miserable sense of the world, my own sense that my life was predestined and that whatever I believed or feared was going to happen was going to happen and that there was nothing I could do about it. And it sort of jolted me into this environment where it was like, you know what? You don't know everything. The world is much bigger than you. You are a very small part of it. It is beautiful and it is awe-inspiring 
and it has possibilities you can't be aware of. And all you can do is be in relationship or in conversation or in exploration with that world, but you are actually not locked in to that sort of clockwork preordained negative prediction that you have for yourself. And I was momentarily free of myself and transcendent without knowing it. And when I think about those moments when the Bryce Canyon memory comes back to me, it often comes back to me as an image when I'm feeling very stuck. And so the power of, of biophilic design, and this is obviously just an introduction to its sort of broader sense, and we haven't gone into its direct application, the power of it in a time of uncertainty when people feel afraid and pessimistic to inspire us to engage with new solutions and new possibilities is tremendous. So uh, thank you very much. Um, it was my pleasure to work with a company like Ikuzini System Alux, who's obviously already been working in this field for, for many, many years, and I was attracted to the company to begin with. And uh, yeah, thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Alan. Um, so I'm not sure if... I'm, uh, I gotta say, I'm, I, I'm a little lost for I should words stop. To, to explain my experience of what we just went through, but uh, you know, a bit of a real mind opening experience. And I really appreciate you taking the time to give us you know, an inspiring overview, uh, which will lead us to also uh, mentioning that I hope you will, uh, I hope you all enjoyed uh, today's session. We'll have a, a few questions. Um, and uh, I'm gonna take the first one, which is uh, from Ed in Chicago. And Ed is asking, uh, how big a trend is biophilia and how long will it last? Um, you know what, I'm gonna just stop sharing my screen. So yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I call biophilia a trend, but the truth is it's much more than a trend. It's a, uh, it's a new approach to the way that we build, that we do projects and that we work with the built environment. So my feeling is that the trends, which might be like we're seeing right now, it might be jungle patterns, it might be very heavily tropical botanical, or it might go very heavily into the desert. Those are trends. The, the, the fundamental orientation towards design as a conversation, as interactive and as relational, I think is, I think is gonna be around for the next hundred years. I think we're at the very beginning of a new way of looking at how we um, are industrious, how we create community and how we build culture. So. I think it's been around for a very long time. Right on. Um, I have a second question that we'll take. Uh, this one is from Nicole in Cleveland. Um, what is your process for determining the impact of a design trend? You know, the I mean, the thing the thing about the way that I work is I think design trends are in it. In a lot of ways, they're obvious. Right? You're looking at magazines and watching TV shows and everybody's talking about a color or a way of doing things. And my interest is never to, to sort of predict what it is, but to understand why that trend is important and how it's going to evolve. So my process is basically to, to see what's happening and then to try to understand why it's happening and then to be able to sort of predict where it's gonna go as opposed to, you know, so, and I'm a big believer that trends are some that are, are not mysterious and that we don't really need to rely on the people around us to be able to be, you know, to know what's coming. What's interesting and what I think we can do is ask ourselves why what is popular is popular and whether it aligns with our own belief system and whether it's inspiring or interesting for our own creative work. That's more where I think the question should go. Right on. Um... We got one more here. Uh, this is from Max in Italy. 
Um, what makes Iguzini Systemlux uniquely positioned as a lighting manufacturer within the biophilia space? I mean, one of the things about, about any kind of um, innovative company that you're always trying to refine your product and you're always and you're always working on making your product more responsive and more adaptable. And to that degree, any product that is um, interactive and connected to the environment, adapt to the environment, responds to the environment is, is essentially a biophilic product. Lighting in particular is probably one of the most powerful elements in biophilic design. So if you're working in the lighting industry in general, there's no way to escape uh, what's happening in bio in, in with biophilia. But for obviously for a company like Iguzini, you can you can see that people that were already on the cutting edge of working in biophilia have sourced companies and decided to work with Iguzini because they have the kind of product that can be that is responsive. It is complex, um, that it is dynamic, and it has all these kinds of attributes. And so, what I think is fascinating again is that the, the work that I do is not to tell a company what to do, but it's to recognize where a company has already been putting all of their creative resources and their energy, and to to understand why that is, and to see how that's going to grow. And so, to me, Iguzini System Lux has already been creating biophilic life, biophilic lighting for years, and is in, set, in a lot of ways ahead of the game. <laughs> Fantastic! It's good, good, good supportive comment for sure, and and yeah. and certainly we are. That is that is a big focus and goal of ours to continue to evolve and innovate, and work as closely as possible with designers and design trends. Uh, to really provide solutions that, that fit uh, the vision of people like yourself and, and the multitude of designers out there that are working in, in this space. And you know, Aaron, I mean, just as I've researched this movement and kind of found my own favorite pet project, it was only after we met that I realized that these projects were actually being done by Iguzini. So a, like a complete coincidence that some of my favorite biophilic projects were done in conjunction with Iguzini and their products. So. Awesome. Um, well, it's an exciting time and an exciting movement. And the uncertainty is, you know, can be a little bit scary, but I think it's inspiring. And 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 the most important thing that I feel like I took away from all that is that it's a motivator to continue to grow and search search within ourselves and out, and outside and around ourselves toward toward beauty and and the things that really elevate our spirit and and can bring us closer to uh, to a greater vision of how we can change the world and, and make it a better place. Design and, and the built environment, as we can see, even as far back as, you know, as Le Corbusier and, and further, is, is an attempt to find solutions for the problems that are facing us. And so biophilia and biophilic design is really a response and a kind of an attempt to find solutions for the problems that are going to face us in the next centuries. So very, very important. Um, very important to, to study it, but also to contribute to it because we're at the very beginning and the people that engage in it now are going to be the people that create um, the movement and the kind of, and the guidelines that are going forward. We're really at the very beginning. Awesome. Well, I mean, like in so many cases, we, we you know, we, we are, I think, concerned for our children and our, and our grandchildren that, you know, there's so much talk about just preserving the beauty that we've all been able to grow up with. And, and clearly this movement is at the forefront of, of doing just that. Um, I want to thank you again, Alan, and I want to thank everybody for joining in. We had a tremendous amount of uh, response and attendance, and it's really exciting. Um, I'd like to let everybody know also that uh, we will move on with the next segment in our series toward the end of October. Um, and that is going to be really exciting where Alan will take a deeper dive into the into real design applications. Um, the next topic is going to uh, look at the influence of, of mushrooms on our design and architectural environments. Anyways, with that, I'd like to wish everybody a great day and a great week. Um, and thank you again. Thank you, Alan. 
and we'll see you again next time. Great. Bye for now. Bye.